Thank you for tuning in to the Urban Network Podcast. This podcast coincides with a monthly networking group that occurs on the third Thursday of each month on Zoom at 5.30 p.m. You could register for events and listen and watch more episodes of the Urban Network Podcast at urbannetwork.biz. Now, here's your episode. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the Urban Network Podcast. Our guest today is Richard Risk. He's the senior attorney and founder of Risk Law a personal injury law firm based in Portland, Oregon, that serves both Oregon and Washington. I've gotten to know Richard um, Mm -hmm. over the last couple of years because he's been very involved in the community of business owners in uh, in South Portland. And I've talked to him at numerous networking events and um, yeah, numerous just networking opportunities at Urban Office. Uh, Richard, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Hewitt. Of course, no. It's uh, it's my pleasure. Um, so I've I've gotten to know you and, and about Rich Law like pretty well. But you know, why don't you tell the people listening about your background? Well, um, I'm the eldest son uh, of two medical professionals. My father was an OBGYN who practiced in suburban Chicago, Illinois, for about forty years. And um, my mother is a psychiatric nurse. Um, She's still living. My father's passed away. Um, I, um, my, my dad's an immigrant and he immigrated from Egypt uh, because um, of a dictator who was ruling Egypt at the time. And um, he came to the United States with a, a lot of hope for a new life for himself. And he kind of passed that ethos on to me. But um, not too long after I was born, I was born in New York City, uh, our family was deported out of the United States uh, because my dad was on a student visa and his student visa had expired. So he got a job with a uh, a Reynolds Aluminum, um, the aluminum foil company, but uh, it was the job was in Guyana, South America. Back then, it was known as British Guyana. Well, I was just an infant at the time, but uh, we were we were deep in the jungle of South America, and we lived there for about almost three years. And uh, we came back to the United States, and I've been back in the States ever since. I, um, when I got into grade school, I uh, discovered that I was different than the other kids in more than one way. In the most noticeable way is I had a nasty little stutter, and the kids just loved to tease me about it. So through this teasing and enduring that, I, I learned to really hate bullies. And um, one day, a guy by the name of Steve Miller, not the band leader, but he just happened to be Steve Miller, he stood up for me and stood up for me and stood up to the bully. And that meant so much to me that I, I wanted to be like him ever since that moment uh, back when I was a little kid. Wow. Yeah. Um, that's cool. Like shout out to Steve Miller. Uh, that's, you know, that's really inspiring. I bet it was very, uh, you know, motivating and just a great example to have two driven immigrant parents who, um, you know, moved to the United States to create like a better life and, uh, both medical professionals too, as well. Um, so, you know, they were extremely intelligent as well as driven and outgoing. So with, with them both having medical backgrounds, how did you uh, choose personal injury law? Well, I should clarify that my mom is, is not an immigrant. Um, my mom uh, grew up in, in uh, central um, United States in the Midwest, and oh. uh, they, they met while my dad and mom were both uh, at medical school. But um, your question's a good one, is how I got into personal injury law. You know, I... I watched my dad uh, working as an obstetrician gynecologist and 
you know, he was, he was up all hours, you know, he was weak, really, it was hard to, for him to get time off and uh, many vacations were cut short. Many vacations never happened because uh, he was called away. And I realized that this is not a life that I would like to live. Um, you know, I was always interested in the law from way back when. Uh, back really since I was in grade school, I've been interested in the law. Um, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do as a lawyer. And um, my first job as a lawyer was working for a subsidiary of Nationwide Insurance. So I started out working for the other side, the insurance companies. And I, I flew around um, uh, Oregon uh, defending insurance companies' interests and uh, defending injury claims and defending workers' compensation claims. I got to know Oregon. And, uh, you know, I, after a while, I, I wanted to kind of do something different and uh, something bigger. And I, I was able to transfer to Chicago, Illinois, and there I managed environmental claims and, and environmental litigation nationally. Um, you know, and it was um, it was a very exciting job, and it helped me get a good understanding of why insurance companies would pay some claims, but not other claims. I really was able to get into the mind of the insurance company and understand their motivations and their fears. And um, you know, after that experience, I, I had an epiphany. Uh, and the epiphany that I had was, gee, wouldn't my knowledge, the knowledge of, of what it takes to defend a claim and what motivates insurance companies to pay claims, wouldn't that knowledge be very helpful for people, everyday people who had claims? And I, you know, I looked around and I saw the plaintiff's attorneys out there and I thought to myself, gee, none of these guys know how to read an insurance policy. Um, very few of them really understand what motivates insurance companies to pay claims. Um, they don't really understand the, the business of insurance or where the money really comes from. And I did. And uh, with that epiphany, I realized, you know, I could really, really help people. And then I started, you know, remembering back when I was bullied and I was pushed around and, and um, you know, I saw that my knowledge and my experience really could come in handy for people who were injured for no fault of their own. And so with that knowledge, I, I started a, a one-man shop in around 2000. First, I started working for other firms a little bit, but then by, by 2001, I had all my own cases. And, um, and then um, it just slowly grew and grew. And, and now, now um, cut 20 years later, I have uh, four lawyers, including myself, working in our office. We have about 10 people in our office. We own our own building. And... Uh, you know, things have gone really well. I think I chose the right path. I'm really happy. Yeah, I, uh, you know, from, I've, you know, I've been in your office uh, several times, um, you know, working on some video and it's a beautiful office. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you chose the right path too because everyone in that building just seems so sharp, you know, personable, conscientious. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful building and you, got, you have a, a great, a firm there and it's such a it's such a unique differentiator you have with that experience working for insurance companies too like no Thank wonder you. you've been able to grow um over over like the years since you've been um since you since you were founded or since ridge law was founded um so what like why why'd you start your own firm instead of just um you know being like your own uh, lawyer or just working uh by yourself well, I mean, you know, at first, as I mentioned, I, I started out working for big firms. I mean, some of the big firms that, that um, you know, most people in 
Portland know about. I worked for many of them as a as a contract lawyer, and you know, I I did notice how the bigger firms um, really treated their employees terribly, and uh, it was really impersonal. And they, especially the big defense firms, they were they were focused on the billable hour. Um, and the big firm sort of paradigm was, you know, like a hamster on a treadmill, you know, just bill more, bill more, bill more. There's never no end to it. And I, I wanted to do things differently. And I also knew that, you know, to be able to handle some of the bigger cases I wanted to handle, it's hard to do that by yourself. And it became harder and harder as the time went on. And, um, you know, as I saw cases go to trial, I'd noticed it was never just one attorney trying the case on either side. It was, it was the attorney and then there was the team behind the attorney uh, Googling and researching in real time. And so, you know, you know probably around 15 years ago, it got it real difficult to uh, try cases and handle larger cases as a one-man shop. I knew I needed a team. And, um, you know, I, uh, luckily my, my law firm is, oh God, it's just a little over a mile from Lewis and Clark Law School. And I went to school there. And so I was able to, um, to uh, convince some of the top talent from Lewis and Clark Law School and some other schools, but the Lewis and Clark, I've been able to get the most of my uh, attorneys and law clerks from and um, I was able to get them to work for me most of the time while they were still clerks uh, so I could uh, get my team on board with my philosophy uh, before their their young impress impressionable brains were contaminated by uh, big law and uh, we did that very well and and we do we, we do have um, I'm proud of, we have some of the best talent of any personal injury law firm in Oregon. Yeah, and uh, I know you mentioned that, um, you know, other larger firms didn't, didn't treat their employees well, but, you know, I used to live uh, just a couple blocks away from Risk Law, and I would walk by and, you know, um, I know you like hosted events, I would see uh, uh, some some people out there like playing cornhole and like barbecuing. And I could just tell that you have such an amazing culture and that you, you all, all of the people that work for Ritz Law are, you know, really, um, you know, goal oriented and, and smart, but it's also, it's obvious that you, you put a lot of work in just to, just to have a great community and culture there as well. Well, it comes down to a concept that I call celebrate the law. And um, it's all about being happy about what you're doing. Uh, wanting to do what you do and wanting to do it with a team that you have and um, and wanting to do it for your clients and being very focused on getting the best possible result for your client. And uh, we, we believe in, you know, working together, playing together. We celebrate our wins and we also, you know, cry together when things don't work out well but um, we're in it together and um, when everybody knows that and feels that I get quite a bit of loyalty and I feel loyal to my staff and extremely loyal to my clients as a result of doing things that way that seems like the the right the only way to do business honestly um, so for people who don't know, who might not be uh, as familiar with law in general, what is personal injury law uh, specifically? Well, you know, uh, philosophically, uh, a personal injury law practice is about evening the playing field. Uh, you know, some person, company, or organization has harmed someone through an unreasonable act or inherently dangerous activity. 
So before I'm ever on the scene, something bad has happened that left my client in the deficit, in the hole, hurt and harmed some way. And so the whole idea behind personal injury law and personal injury practice is to get back to zero. It's not about getting clients at windfall. Uh, no one's going to be happy that they were hurt. Uh, we're trying to get them the most compensation uh, under the circumstances to make them whole. And that's what personal injury law is all about. So would, would uh, your, who would I, your ideal client be? Just anyone who is injured by the fall of someone else? Well, uh, the first thing is, and it, you might laugh when I say this, but my ideal client is a human being. And so I say this because you know, some law firms, they don't represent human beings. They represent entities like banks, you know, in insurance companies um, and uh, big businesses. And we don't represent entities. We represent people, people with eyes, nose, hearts, families. Um, that's who we represent. And so we're looking for a human being, the ideal client, is someone who cares and when I say cares, it's someone who cares about him or herself, someone who cares about the claim that's involved in the case, someone who cares and demonstrates that caring by following their doctor's orders. When I say care about themselves, I mean the person treats and, and tries to get better, uh, the ideal client cares and they show that by cooperating with their lawyer uh, cares by being truthful and cares and motivated by a strong desire to live life passionately and not give up and then um, besides caring in all those ways the client um, ideal client would be realistic um, you know, when we first send out a demand letter, uh, I say that we're going to put the number we're going to put there is usually going to be a hit the baseball out of the baseball park number. But it's not hit the baseball to China because that's not realistic. Um, that's not something that we can substantiate. That's pie in the sky. Uh, we want our clients to be realistic about the damages that they've incurred, the strength of their case. Um, the time needed to heal and resolve their case. You know, once you settle your case, it's, it's done. And, uh, and everybody wants their case resolved yesterday. But, you know, you, you can't put grapefruit juice in a microwave and expect to get high-quality Pinot. Um, it, it takes time. And, and I, it takes time because part of the value in the case is what's in the chart notes, what's in the opinions of the doctors, what's in the medical testing, and what's in the factual investigation. And to get all that lined up uh, does take time, and we're looking for a client is realistic about all those things. Uh, the next factor is the ideal client uh, is someone who appreciates um, the value of the services of my law firm and uh, Listen, uh, you know, we know our services are valuable. And one indicator that our, our services are valuable is that medical creditors, those who are owed money because of the loss, you know, they may have performed a surgery, they may have done physical therapy, but they haven't been paid in full. Generally speaking, when the medical creditor, creditors Thing, the injured, the medical creditors are happy. They're very happy. And they're very happy because they know when a qualified attorney and legal team gets on board, the 
probability of a good recovery skyrockets. And uh, the chances of them getting reimbursed skyrockets too. Um, you know, many people, they, they're very smart. They've been through many different transactions like buying a car, buying a house, you know, and they say, you know, what's the big deal? I can negotiate this. Um, it's very different. It's, you've got to know how to move the pieces. And analogy I give people all the time is, you know, trying to resolve a personal injury claim is like trying to play chess when you only know how to play checkers. You sit down, the board looks familiar, you move your pieces, but before you know it, boom, they got your queen um, and there's checkmate. You don't even know what happened uh, because you don't know the rules of the game and many people who, almost all people who aren't represented, unless they are personal injury attorneys themselves, really don't understand um, uh, how the personal injury game is played. And uh, it, 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 there are, it is a game, um, and it's a game that can easily, easily be lost if you don't know what you're doing. And uh, finally, um, you know, my ideal client um, should have a compelling story. And, uh, you know, like a, an identifiable, identifiable wrongdoer, a clear wrong needing correction. And I say a, a compelling story is necessary because, you know, I want, I'm looking for that story because I'll be telling that story or I'm planning and preparing that story to tell it to a jury from the very first time I meet somebody. Um, so I'm looking for the story and I'm looking for a compelling story and the ideal client will have that. Okay. Um, so you just gave us a good idea about who your ideal client is and when it comes down to it, they're human beings. Um, yep. now how would that often dif uh, differ from who your ideal defendant would be? Well, I mean, it, it's kind of funny. You know, you asked me this question before we did this. I thought, well, who's my ideal defendant? Well, uh, the big bad wolf would be my ideal defendant, if if possible. Um, you know, I mean, it's you you when you're telling a story. You know, there's the classic story, and the classic story is um, the hero. You know, has a problem. And the hero comes back home, and the problem's solved. And um, there's always a, a villain to a good story. So, and the villain's not always who you think it is. For example, in trucking cases, you know, the it's easy to blame the trucker, but usually there's someone behind the trucker. Usually there's someone behind the person who did the bad act. So the question is, is who's the real? the real bad actor here um, and look beyond the sort of fall guy that's often out there. So we we're looking for either a, a, and we don't, we don't, our goal is not to bankrupt individuals. So we're looking for a human being with good insurance coverage. And so the claim involved has to have insurance coverage to it. And that's one, one of my benefits from, being in, in claims as I can identify those types of claims that are usually not excluded from insurance policy. So the good defendant is going to have insurance coverage for this specific claim. Um, if it's a person or if it's not a person uh, like a company, uh, if it's a big company and sometimes companies are self-insured, they're so big, uh, that they're able to pay the claims themselves. You know, maybe this company isn't in the business of insurance, so they pay somebody else to handle the claims. That's called a third-party administrator. But um, if it's this company uh, insurance coverage, it needs to be a large self-insured entity 
with sufficient assets to pay the claim. Uh, because in end, the end, uh, our goal is to, um, to, to get the most amount of money in our client's pocket as possible. Yeah, I've, I've seen uh, some of the case results uh, on your website and um, it's, it's pretty amazing the amount of, uh, of like money you've been able to get to your clients ranging from tens of thousands, more often uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and even above a million or, or millions at some point. Um, so I'm curious, like what is the measure of a successful case? Well, I touched on it in the last uh, question we talked about, but you know, it's the measure is, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not necessarily getting a big verdict from a jury um, because behind that big verdict, if you're trying a case um, and a, the case goes on for a week or two, boy, you're paying a lot of an expert costs. You have to pay a lot of, a lot of people to try that case to, to help prove your case. So it's fine to, to, to go to a jury trial, but in the end, um, you don't want to spend so much money on experts. For example, uh, if a case needs a neurologist, you're looking at maybe $3,000 an hour for a neurologist. You can see if you have to, to have that person testify for five, six hours or prepare that much, uh, how much money a, a case could cost just for one particular expert in preparation and testifying cost, testimony cost. So, you know, what we do is we, we take into consideration, you know, a likely result from a jury, how much it's going to cost to pay the experts to prepare the case for trial and be in trial. And um, our fee and all the other costs with the ultimate goal and the, to get the most money in our clients' pockets. You know, if that means, you know, playing hopscotch, uh, we'll play hopscotch, but whatever it takes to get the most money in our clients' pockets, that's what we're going to do. And there's creative ways uh, besides litigation to resolve cases like arbitration or mediation. Uh, but each case is different, and you kind of want the best tool for that particular case. And, uh, so that you can, we can get the most money in our client's pocket when it's all said and done. And um, then what type of uh, personal injury cases has your firm seen uh, the most success or have it has seen uh, success in at all? Well, I mean, we've, we've, um, they're on our website, but boy, we've had a broad range of, of uh, types of claims. Most of our claims have been transportation re related uh, claims. I mean, we had uh, one of the most interesting cases we had was uh, a couple took a romantic ride in a, in a hot air balloon. And uh, just as the gentleman got the ring out of his hand and was going to put it on her finger, high winds came along and they ended up having a hard landing and both bride and groom crushed their respective right feet um, and uh, that's even aeronautic claims we've handled like that one but uh, commercial trucking cases um, those cases are generally good cases because you have um, a villain which is usually the trucking company and you have high um, insurance limits um, we handle a lot of medical much pressure on the medical industry right now that we're seeing a lot of mistakes, uh, unforced mistakes that we didn't see just a few years ago. Um, and we're also seeing more workplace harassment cases. Um, you know, it just, you know, you can tell in the environment, in this COVID environment, people are stressed out and they're taking it out uh, on their coworkers. Uh, they're taking it out of people you know, that are close to them. Um, we're, we've, we've, because of the 
<clears throat> unrest in, in Portland, we've seen uh, a lot of, um, uh, uh, and surrounding areas, uh, police behaving badly cases. Um, we've had cases where police officers smash into our clients at high speed. We've had uh, police officers who have um, uh, treated our clients roughly uh, um, while they're on the street, um, whether our client was not a suspect of anything. Um, we have resolved successfully many premises liability cases. And that's where um, something happens in a, in a, usually a store or something falls off a shelf or uh, something's left slippery on the floor and someone falls. We've handled quite a few of those. All kinds of denied insurance claims. Sometimes the insurance companies deny a claim and deny coverage or deny for whatever reason, and that's not always a good reason. So we resolve several of those. Uh, have you noticed that there's a lot of dogs during uh, COVID? Well, there's a lot of dog bike bites too. Uh, not all these dogs have been trained. Um, even though Portland is a rainy place, uh, we've had a fair amount of motorcycle accident cases, pedestrian accident, accident cases. Um, sadly, um, I hope I never see another one of these, but uh, we've been involved in a, a recently a few uh, sex abuse claims, uh, child sex abuse claims, um, we've had just recently, um, there's a Legionnaires outbreak at a, at a, at a, um, home in, um, that mostly older folks lived in, in, in Portland. And we have, uh, one of those claims of all kinds of, uh, contamination claims from, uh, from sewage overflow to contamination overflow to other types of environmental uh, releases, uh, environmental contamination that that uh, causes damage to somebody's property or uh, causes uh, injury. And then we've um, we've resolved several different types of wrongful death claims where uh, someone makes a mistake and uh, unfortunately it it ends in the the death of an innocent person. So those are just generally the the types of cases that we've re resolved successfully i mean some of those we've we've, we've litigated um, some of those we've we've settled um, but uh, that gives you kind of an idea of the types of cases we've uh, worked on yeah i imagine working on a lot of these uh cases might be pretty intense and just like emotionally taxing um uh just with the damages involved but uh it's it is just like really important and you know, great that that you and and Risk Law are there to stand up for these people and these families. Um, I I am I am curious uh, because a lot of the listeners um, of this podcast are professionals, aspiring business owners, small business owners, and I'm going to kind of just like switch gears here a little bit. And I'm curious, as a business owner, um, what has worked for you in terms of getting new cases and uh, raising awareness of your firm? Well, I mean, the, the, the most obvious um, place to get case, cases in new business is right in front of your nose, and um, that would be your current clients. Um, your current, if you do good work, your current clients um, re recommend you to their friends, their families, and there may be related cases uh, to the case that you currently represent them on. Uh, for more work. Um, so that's the, and you already have a business relationship with your current clients. You don't have to have a get to know you. Um, there's a certain trust that's already been developed. And so that's an obvious and, and often. But, um, you know, we, we do a lot of blogging and uh, we, we talk about emerging areas and we try to help the consumer, you know, there's a lot of do-it-yourselfers out there. So we try to help the do-it-yourselfer um, to the extent that they can resolve their own case. Some cases you can resolve your case by yourself. Sometimes you don't need an attorney. 
Um, if if uh, people can do that, then more power to them. We we give them some tips uh, to help them do that effectively and point out some pitfalls for them to avoid uh, through our blogging. Uh, you know, it's hard to talk about advertising and not mention Google. Uh, we do a lot of Google advertising pay-per-click, you know, what each industry, but uh, it's one of those things that you can waste a lot of money on it if, if you're not targeted, uh, but if you're doing it right, it can work uh, fantastically. Obvious, you know, um, you know, this is not, the next one is an obvious one, but also an overlooked one is just ask for the business, uh, um, you know, you know just right out say, you know, listen, if uh, someone um, uh, lets you know that um, they have an insurance or injury claim, think of me and we can really help them. Um, and just the ask, which many people, including myself, uh, are sometimes shy about asking and no one wants to put themselves um, um, in a place where they will be rejected or make someone else feel uncomfortable. But you know, if you have a relationship with someone enough, you can you can just casually ask them for business um, at the appropriate time, but not all the time. Um, networking is a good way to get business. You know, there's a there's a uh, many different uh, networking groups, and most well known is uh, Business Networking International or BNI. Um, they um, referral. I'm not a member of BNI, but I know it works for a lot of people. It's based yeah, upon um, re relationships, and um, you know you have to be reciprocal, or you're not going to get much business yourself. And then you know, I mean, the one, one of the biggest ways we get business is, frankly, by doing a lot of free work for other people. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time on the phone, just you know, holding their hand and you know, telling them what to do, and and just helping them, you know, figure this out because I, you know, I don't, it bothers me to see people get taken advantage of by insurance companies. And so I'll do whatever I can uh, within reason to, to help people help themselves. And, uh, you know, that, you know, that is that goodwill, you know, is never wasted. Yeah, I, uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, I've definitely, you know, uh, have been a part of many networking groups, including BNI, which uh, has been extremely useful in, in getting referrals. And uh, Urban Network, of course, um, you know, this is the Urban Network podcast. So mm -hmm. if you're interested in upcoming networking events, go to urbannetwork.biz. You know, I had to uh, promote that right there. And, um, and, and asking for the business as well, because there is a good time and place for that. And you know, something I've enjoyed about, you know, hosting this podcast is it almost gives an opportunity for business owners to, you know, promote their business. And it's almost like an indirect ask for the guests that come on here or just a way to just increase their, you know, exposure online or LinkedIn and YouTube and whatnot. And, um, you know, with that, I'm going to segue that into, uh, into our last question, um, actually, because I'm, you know, running, running out of time here. But if people want to uh, learn more about risk law or get a hold of you because they think they might be in need of your services, how can they uh, get a hold of you? Well, um, R I Z K L A W dot com. That's R I Z K L A W dot com is our website. There's all kinds of information on the cases that we've handled, the types of cases we've worked on, and how to get in touch with us on that website. Risklaw dot com. And uh, our phone number, of course, is 503-245-5673. Uh, That's 503-245-5677. And my email is rich, R-I-C-H, at R-I-Z-K-L-A-W dot com. That's R I C H at R I Z K L A W dot com. Thank you. Um, 
Richard, it was so uh, great having you on the podcast today. Um, you know, you have such an amazing, uh, like moral compass and, you know, strong character and uh, always great, just like feedback and knowledge to provide. You're just, uh, you know, wonderful uh, to be around when, you know, I did have the opportunity to see you more frequently before COVID. And um, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and taking time out of your day to, to talk with me today. So thank you so much for, for coming on the Urban Network podcast. I really appreciate it. All right, Hewitt, we'll see you at the Urban Office very soon. Yeah, will do. And uh, everyone who's listening, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. And if you're interested in attending uh, local networking events or networking events on Zoom, go to urbannetwork.biz. Thank you and have a great day.